Good morning, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving to you. It is indeed Thanksgiving Sunday, October the 11th, 2020. And we are here once again in the sanctuary of Ansley United in Markdale. And uh, I hope that you and your family have as good a Thanksgiving as you possibly can, given all the restrictions that we're facing this year, uh, once again, during this COVID time. Just a couple of things to tell you before we begin. Uh, a reminder about our online auction on October 22nd. And uh, we're really hoping that a, a whole bunch of you will uh, sign up online to uh, register for the auction. That way you get to uh, watch everything uh, in live time. And uh, you don't have to bid on anything if you don't want to, but it does give you the possibility to participate. So Patty will be sending out all the details in an announcement, and uh, we hope that you'll sign up for that. <clears throat> the second thing is that we uh, have had you know, ongoing conversations about reopening our uh, church for church services, but it just seems that the prudent thing to do right now at this time is to just uh, postpone any kind of reopening and uh, continue as we are. And uh, we know that many of you, in fact, I think all of you are enjoying our online YouTube services. And uh, so we'll keep going with that uh, for uh, as long as we need. And uh, perhaps it'll become uh, a new form of ministry here at uh, Ansley and maybe something that that will uh, get legs and, and be something wonderful and creative. So uh, just letting you know about that. And uh, as always, we'll communicate directly with you uh, about any other uh, changes to that plan. So without further ado, and uh, to get us going for Thanksgiving, uh, David's going to play our prelude. <laughs> We light this candle with grateful hearts so that with our hearts full of love and light, we might enter into the spirit of thanksgiving with joy. May it be so. Amen. For our call to worship today, I wanted to read a poem by E.E. E. Cummings. It is called, I Thank You, God, for Most This Amazing. I thank you, God, for most this amazing day for the leaping greenly spirits of trees and a blue true dream of sky and for everything which is natural, which is infinite, which is yes. I who have died am alive again today and this is the sun's birthday. This is the birthday of life and love and wings and of the gay great happening illimitably earth how should tasting, touching, hearing, seeing, breathing, any lifted from the know of all nothing, human merely being, doubt unimaginable you? Now the ears of my ears awake, and now the eyes of my eyes are opened. 
And so our hymn is the traditional Thanksgiving hymn, number 516, 516, Come, You Thankful People, Come. Let's bow our heads for our opening prayer. Once a year, we gather together to give God thanks and praise. Once a year, we delight in our life giver, our creator, the divine painter, who every other day simply delights in us. May we be today like the elegant seahorse dancing with joy in the oceans. May we be like the crickets and cicadas, making noise like there's no tomorrow. May we be like the water cascading over a fall, tripping and shouting, welcoming new life. May we be like the chipmunk, our mouths so full we can't speak, but only nod our praise. May we be like the bumblebees and the hummingbirds, persistent promoters of new growth from one to another. And may we be like a chorus of a thousand voices gathered together to sing God's praise, even with our masks on. May our voices rise like incense and form a wondrous smoky cloud of thanksgiving permeating our lives and giving us fresh hope for tomorrow. 
May all of this be in our hearts and spirits today as we finally give back some praise to our maker. May it be so. Amen. Now we're going to sing just two verses of a hymn from More Voices, number 30, and it is called, uh, it's a song of praise to the maker, verses one and four. Gosh, what a beautiful piece of music. <clears throat> Let's take a moment to bow our uh, heads in prayer again. Do we stop long enough to say thanks, O oh God? When the little one brushes our cheek on his way to bed, when the bees pollinate the tomatoes and the flowers, when the tender voice calling us on the phone says, I miss you, do we have room in our very full hearts for thanksgiving? For the times of struggle and disappointment which end up teaching us? For the times we almost give up but then find the way? For the time a long promised apology actually lands upon our doorstep? Do we stop long enough to say thanks for the blessings that we take for granted when the power goes out, when the neighbor brings in our paper from the rain, even when grief interrupts our life, but still we find joy in memories of past Thanksgiving? Do we have room in our very full hearts, for the giver of all, for the beloved who loves our souls, for the spirit of life which holds us and lifts us up, for the thousands who've gone before us as our ancestors, the ones who made us who we are, for the freedom to worship or not, for the strength to stand up to right a wrong. Do we have room for love, for the neglected, for the stranger, for the lonely one next door, for the street person who really just wants money, for the one we cannot forgive? 
On this Thanksgiving Day, may our hearts be expansive enough to hold the many layers of gratitude and to pause long enough for the light of our Creator to shine on every living thing that we might be mindful of every living thing. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. And now we bring our voices together in the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So our scripture reading today is a very familiar tale from the Gospel of Luke, Luke 17, uh, 11 to 19. It happened that as he made his way toward Jerusalem, Jesus crossed over the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten men, all lepers, met him. They kept their distance but raised their voices, calling out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Taking a good look at them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priests. They went, and while still on their way, became clean. One of them, when he realized that he had been healed, turned around and came back, shouting his gratitude, glorifying God. He kneeled at Jesus' feet, so grateful. He couldn't thank him enough, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus said, were ten not healed? Where are the nine? Can none be found to come back and give glory to God except this outsider? Then he said to him, get up, go on your way. Your faith has healed and saved you. Here ends our gospel reading. Each year at Thanksgiving, when we have our family gathered around our Thanksgiving table, we go around the table, we ask each person to name one thing for which they are thankful. Sometimes it elicits giggles of nervous energy. Sometimes eye rolls, as you can tell that perhaps maybe they're all just humoring Joan and me as some kind of relics from another age. But however small, it is our ritual. It's our yearly trip to gratitude land. And because, well, we'd be lesser without it, I think. Indeed, if I could bottle up the practice of gratitude and sell it as a pill, I would certainly be rich. Because, like everything else in our lives, we don't want to do the work to have the effect. We want the benefits without doing anything about it ourselves. Actually, the benefits of some kind of gratitude practice, however small in your life, are really huge. According to the GGSC, the Greater Good Science Center, which published a landmark study on gratitude three or four years ago, in that study they reviewed hundreds of studies done in this relatively new discipline of gratitude. And here are some of the proven benefits. Heart rate stability improves, improves sleep, less fatigue, fewer hospital readmissions, many physical improvements such as lower blood sugar and more stable hemoglobins to name a few, higher life satisfaction, a decrease in materialism, 
protection from burnout in sports and work, increase in feelings of self-worth and esteem, help with drug and alcohol rehab, help in recovery from post-traumatic stress, positive benefits in overall educational scores for adolescents. And I'm just scratching the surface. So it seems to me that if some of those benefits are even partially true, it begs the question, then why is gratitude so hard? Why is it something that most of us reserve for the one day a year set aside for giving thanks, kind of like Valentine's Day is for people who have a hard time saying, I love you. Actually, it occurs to me that in our secular, secularized culture, maybe no one is using Thanksgiving weekend for, well, you know, giving thanks. I mean, essentially, for most people, the sum total of Thanksgiving weekend is a whole lot of yard work followed by a big turkey dinner. Gratitude for one's turkey dinner seems, I don't know, a little shallow, perhaps, given the wide disparities in our society. Counting our blessings is, of course, a good idea, especially when we're conscious of where our blessings come from. But even that exercise sometimes seems a little self-congratulatory, don't you think? Look at how much we have. Look at how successful we are. Aren't we the best? So this kind of thanksgiving doesn't stir me very deeply. How about you? This may be the reason why Jesus was taken aback by the thoughtlessness of the nine healed lepers in the story from Luke today. Having just received a brand new leprosy-free life, only one of them returns to say thank you for getting their life back. I sometimes think that offering thanks requires an admission of inadequacy or imperfection that many of us are afraid of. And it strikes me that we want all the ecstasy of the grand return to normalcy without confronting the shadows that lurk inside our lives. You know yourselves through this COVID time, we have confronted the shadows. And so we're ready, aren't we, for thanksgiving. We shudder, though, at pain and suffering generally. We prefer to hide it away. We live in a time of such cold and dark despair. Even our despair is too difficult to face most of the time, at least on a daily basis. Oh, how we'd love to just glide over the surface and hope that today the monsters don't come to the surface. And I can hear you say, can't we just glibly say thanks over a Thanksgiving dinner for the dinner and hope that at least we've ticked the box on this year's to-do list? Who wants to say thanks anyway? for 2020, the annus horribilis we are currently enduring, this pandemic acting as a pall of death and fear over all our normal life. Who wants to face fears when we can listen like catatonic sycophants to the daily dose of money disguised as hope? by our governments. But that doesn't stir me deeply either. How about you? What we may not know is that gratitude has a power and it acts powerfully and best when done in dark, difficult situations. So there's a Welsh poet by the name of David White who recounts in a, a book of his 
when he was on a marine ship sailing around the Galapagos Islands doing scientific and biological marine experiments. On board the ship were experts in various sciences from all over the world, people with letters after their name a mile long. One night, a storm approached, so the captain steered the boat into a cove to wait out what turned into a bit of a monsoon. In the night, the boat tossed and turned, pretty well everyone feeling seasick. But the captain, well accustomed to these seas, lay sound asleep in his quarters, not a care in the world. White went up on deck to get some air, and he saw in the black of the night a wall of stone, a cliff that wasn't very far from the ship. The boat was drifting and would soon be smashed on the rocks. His shouts roused the crew and the captain in time to spare an impending disaster which had been really very close. That night at dinner on the ship, a subdued celebration of thanksgiving. A few glasses of the finer stuff, of course, were poured, but it was a somber crowd that celebrated the new life. And yet, uh, White writes, it was a moment of profound gratitude, astonishment at their good fortune, having come so close to death, yet still alive. Who, we might ask, would struggle to find something for which to be grateful around that Thanksgiving table when it is basically your own beating heart inside of you, inside of your still intact body that counts the most. The shadows of gratitude, you see, reveal some depth. My wife Joan and I once traveled to the little remote island of Molokai. Molokai is in Hawaii. It's just off the coast of Maui. It's remote. It's untraveled. It still retains a sense of wild wariness toward the outside world. We were there, though, to visit the leprosy colony that exists on the far side of the island. Perhaps you know the story of Father Damien and Mother Marianne, the saints of the place. They brought dignity and order to this wild peninsula where victims, usually young kids, most of them, were thrown off the boats and told to swim to shore. The graveyards there contain the bodies of about 12,000 victims as it was near impossible for native Hawaiians to fight off the infections brought to them by the colonizers. Leprosy, I guess, being perhaps the most gruesome of the lot. Incidentally, there are still four people alive there with leprosy, uh, healed of course, who still call Kala'upapa home. Most of them, of course, are long dead. Others who were cured were free to go and live normal lives in other places. It was a tough day. But we finally began to understand what lepers had endured. Not only was it the physical pain of the disease, it was the utter and total rejection from family and community sentenced to die in a remote, unforgiving place. In fact, not caring whether your own offspring lived or died. In Jesus' time, it would be no different. Lepers were stigmatized and forced to lead humiliating lives, begging for their existence. I can totally see why those 10 lepers wouldn't want to return at all. They would run, run for their life. And so why is this 
story of the lepers so commonly told on Thanksgiving Sunday. In a secular world in which leprosy barely exists and I would maintain it's because it has a power underneath the surface in the dark places of fear and distrust. That's where that story kind of operates. And so at least once a year, we're called to look at that place and then give thanks. Verena Cast, in her lovely book, Joy, Inspiration, and Hope, makes the point that we've simply forgotten to emphasize the ways people learn to transcend themselves. Since so many in our time have left their religions behind, indeed, both Judaism and Christianity seek transcendence in their own unique ways, and of course, in very ancient forms. Tra uh, Thanksgiving is just one of those traditional uh, times of, of seeking transcendence, uh, but it's still done in these very ancient forms. But the bottom line of it is that gratitude provides a path to transcend your own ego to transcend your own desires, and to transcend your shadow sides. And the question might be, why do we need to do that? And I think the answer is, so that will be restored. So that will be restored. The purpose of some of our ancient rituals is not just to bow down and acknowledge the giver, though it starts with that, of course, but rather more deeply, the purpose of the ritual is to help you transcend your life and then to be restored to it. The restoration of morale and courage, the restoration of joy after a long period of mourning, the restoration of hope after plumbing the depths of all the seriously bad stuff that can cascade upon us. My friends, these are miracles. They're miracles that, that take place in the human heart. Cast says that all therapeutic work should begin with joy. And what she says is that once we've found the deep and dark places, we also can find the joy there as well. That, that even in difficult, dark times, small moments of joy or hope can and do bubble up. And these are signs that there are deep, deep currents going on in our lives. You probably know the quote from Emily Dickinson who wrote, Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words. The tune without the words and never stops at all. And so another reason to stop for a little real thanksgiving, a bit of gratitude, it might be the only way that most of us can glimpse the undercurrents of joy and hope in our lives. In that greater good sciences report, report, it's clear that gratitude is the social glue of our society. You can easily grasp how deeply it runs uh, in us <clears throat> by looking at things from the opposite view. Think how offended we are when we do something or make something or fix something for someone and they show no signs of gratitude. We're offended, it hurts, it makes us bitter. You can almost hear somebody, somebody say to you, if it hasn't been said to you at one point in your life, after all I've done for you, that's the thanks I get. But gratitude works on the 
positive side of the equation. Its main function is to expand our hearts and restore our relationships. To expand our hearts and restore us in relationship to one another and also to the giver. Look, it's been a rough year. Our ship has been nearly crashing into a cliff for more than six months now. Most of us are feeling kind of sick at heart. Perhaps we feel like no one has suffered as much as we have with all the restrictions and such. But even if it's a more somber gathering this year, smaller than normal, perhaps, we can now really name the shadows. We've seen the murky depths. We've seen the shape of our fear. We've seen the nature of ourselves. Even our less than pretty selves. But haven't we also seen the beauty and dignity of the human character? Haven't we also seen the depth of courage of our frontline workers going to work every day against the all odds, the, the resolve of teachers in our schools, the we're just going to do our best attitude that has really helped all of us even here at church, stay strong and hopeful. All we have to do now is to look beneath the good and the bad and see the strong, undying current of hope and joy and the infinite loving embrace of our Creator, all of which run underneath our lives no matter what and return. Thanks. May it be so. Amen. Now it's time for our final hymn, which is number 227, For the Fruit of All Creation. Number 227.
Well, friends, we hope that you have a wonderful Thanksgiving uh, with those of you that can gather this uh, year. Let us go with this blessing. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. So let us go in peace. Amen. And now our postlude. <laughs>